Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our lunch session uh, this, uh, conversation. While the participants of the Riga conference are eating their lunch, we are going to continue the conversation here, uh, f mainly for our live stream audience, but we also have an audience uh, from the conference joining us uh, as well. Uh, my name is Adam Reichert. I'm the editor-in-chief of New Eastern Europe, a bi-monthly magazine based in Poland, and I have the honor of hosting this discussion, which is titled Social Media and Foreign Affairs, who spins whom? I think it's a very relevant and timely topic. I'm very pleased that the organizers chose this, this topic, and we're very lucky to have a very, uh, a very good panel um, of experts who are going to give us some really good insight uh, and their reflections on this topic. I just want to remind everybody out there who is watching on the live stream that I will be monitoring the Twitter feed, and I do encourage, if you have questions, comments, please uh, feel free to use the hashtag RigaConf17. And I'll be uh, monitoring the feed and interjecting some of the comments and questions uh, to our panel, just as we have been <coughs> throughout the whole conference here. So today we are going to talk about uh, the power of social media, uh, which is, I think, a very incredible phenomenon in terms of looking at humanity. Uh, it's been maybe just slightly over 10 years since the social media has really picked up and has become a part of most of our lives. Uh, and uh, in the beginning, we all thought it was going to be a, a great way to connect uh, and to integrate societies and peoples around the world, share what we had for dinner, what restaurants we went to, or where we went for holiday. And indeed, Facebook uh, alone has nearly 2 billion users uh, today. Uh, the question of whether they're real or not is, is a different question uh, to decide, but uh, we cannot deny the fact that social media is a very important part of most people's lives in, uh, on this planet. So we're going to look at how uh, this, has, this process has evolved and how not only is social media used to connect people, which is a very positive thing, but it also how it's being used to start to promote ideas, to enhance emotions, uh, and especially to divide people, uh, which is a very negative side, uh, and neg very negative aspect of social media. And I'm very lucky to have an expert panel of three, uh, three individuals who are joining me uh, today. Um, on my far left is Mr. Christophe uh, Genesti. Uh, he is a digital strategist and communications and PR executive who's going to be giving us some very interesting insight and reflections from his work and uh, in, in, in looking at social media networks and some of the, the, uh, he does a lot of advising on social media. So we're looking forward uh, to that. Um, ben Nemo, who uh, is a senior fellow with the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Research Lab. He's done a lot of excellent work uh, uncovering and exposing fake accounts, fake news spreaders, especially ones that are um, nefariously promoting uh, an agenda uh, which, which may in, in fact uh, impact uh, other people's interests. So welcome, Ben. Welcome, Christoph, and last but not least, Konstantin von Eggert, who is a Russian journalist and commentator with Doj TV, TV Rain in Moscow, and has some keen insight on the situation there as well. So, gentlemen, <coughs> welcome, and I'm going to start with you, Christoph, right away, because I think I would like to, for you to kind of set up the, our discussion and looking at how social media has changed um, the way we interact. Not only is it, is it a way that we we receive information, but it's also a way that uh, emotions are spread uh, throughout the globe, something that has never really, ha we have seen in, in our history in such, a, in such a large scale. So are we living in mm, what we could call a brave new world where our lives are spent more and more on social media um, and where the information that we are receiving is shaping not only how we perceive the world, but how we act, how we, um, vote and how, how we shape our own ideas. Thank you, Adam. Um, and thank you very much for the organizers to having me today. It's a great conference. I've been uh, to, the, to the different panels yesterday and this morning. It was really uh, inspiring conference. And I will start, if you allow me, with, uh, with something I heard yesterday evening. I was uh, listening to panel uh, discussion and uh, one of the panelists uh, mentioned social media and mainstream media and he wanted to point that traditional media what he was calling mainstream media uh, was different from social media mm. and what i would like to say uh, as a first take on the discussion is that 
what is really mainstream today is not anymore traditional media, but what is mainstream today is social media. And you have to understand this as a first take uh, of today's world. Social media is not anymore a new media, is not anymore a new kind of exotic uh, space or whatever. Social media has become mainstream. It has become mainstream for everybody, for political leaders, for journalists, for uh, citizens, for consumers, etc. It is mainstream. And this is the first thing that everybody has to have in mind when approaching uh, this, this, uh, this, uh, this world. Do not consider anymore social media as a separate world that, is, that, has, that has a kind of a satellite uh, world. It's the mainstream world, it's the number one place where people are making decisions and sharing information. The second thing that you need to have in mind when you consider this is that if you assume that, if you accept the idea that this is media, social media, you have to understand that this media is very particular. Uh, this media, uh, on this media, people are not sharing information, people are sharing mainly emotions, right? So, when you're, when you're sharing online on Facebook, could be Twitter, could be Instagram, could be wh whatever kind of network, you know? The first interaction that the network is proposing you to have is a like, is something that you, 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 you claim that you like something, that you, you, you like your friend, you like what your network is doing, etc. So, this is, again, something very important to have in mind every time that you're approaching social media. It's not a media carrying information, it's a media carrying mainly emotions, right? The third thing that uh, I would like you to, to, to think about uh, when setting, setting the scene of this discussion, we've been talking a lot, a lot about fake news today, yesterday, and I, I would say for the last couple of years, we've been talking about fake news like everywhere. You have again, uh, well, this is my take on it, you have again to consider that fake news is no news, right? It's not new. People have been faking f like forever, you know? Human beings are telling lies forever, have been telling lies forever. And political leaders have been promoting fake stories like forever, you know? coming from the antique world, coming from the, you know, at the time of when people start to socialize, when there's a political power on top of people, on top of any community, you're going to have fake. You're going to have fake news, right? You're going to have fake stuff. So what is new? It's not the fake news. And you know this Chinese proverb when, when, when the wise man pointing, uh, points to the moon, the stupid one uh, looks at the finger. Uh, we are spending years and times and uh, tribunes and uh, you know a lot of energy to comment about fake news but come on what is new is the power of sharing is the power of you know carrying those emotions right because every political leader if you if you go back to history we were talking about history uh, in the previous session and someone was telling well it's a really pity that people we do not teach history anymore right you can if you teach history, you, you can go back many, many centuries and you will see incredible stories of fake news. If you go to, if you go to visit antique temples, you know, you will see on the temples themselves sculptures of fake news, right? So, in fact, what is, what is new, really, is not the news itself. What is new is the incredible power of dissemination uh, of those news, right? And... Um, and the fourth element I would like to, to, to uh, put on the table to, to inspire and set the scene is that this social media uh, is incredibly easy to manipulate and incredibly cheap to manipulate. Yesterday, uh, Twitter leaders were uh, heard, uh, heard by the, the uh, American administration uh, about because of their roles, potential roles of Russians on the election uh, campaign, American election campaigns. And the, the guy, uh, a Twitter executive, told yesterday that um, Russia Today, which is one, one very famous media uh, that we all know, has just bought 1,823 tweets for the, the, the amount of money of $200,000. 
you know? So we're talking about nearly 2,000 tweets <coughs> just paid, you know? Uh, a very little amount of money. So what we have to consider if we're talking about social media, the importance of social media and fake news and that kind of stuff, is that we are facing uh, a very brand new media, right? That is mainstream and which is a mainstream flow of information, of emotions, not uh, sorry about that, and that's, that is so easy to manipulate and to control. So this is, this is really the challenge that every government or every leader uh, must face, or every brand in another, in another area. Uh, you are in front of this, and this changes everything. Because if you want to fight uh, propaganda or fake news with facts, as an example, you will lose everything. Because you don't understand that on social media, people don't care about facts. Yeah? People care about emotions. And when I will share something from uh, from you because I know you and I and I, I trust you, and if I if if you if you tweet something about something that is really emotional for you because I know you because I respect you because I trust you, I will eventually retweet it, you know, because I feel that you've got an emotion. I don't know if it's accurate. I don't know if it's relevant, but I will share it. This is the problem. The sharing mechanism is the problem. And last but not least, and I and I and I, I'm sure that. Uh, ben will we'll elaborate much more about this. Uh, all this social media is powered by robots, right? Is that it's not only a mainstream media, a mainstream emotional flow, but this emotional flow is powered by robots, mm. right? And we assume, uh, different uh, organizations assume that more than 50% of the entire internet traffic is not human, is machines. Right. So, when you understand that you can manipulate this, you can have, have an impact on this, you can be helped concretely by machines who will spread the news further than you, you would have dreamed uh, to, sp to spread the news. Well, thank you very much, Christoph. I think it was some very good points setting up this discussion and very interesting how you ended, especially about robots who are spreading emotions, right? Um, yeah. In some ways, it is a little bit uh, of the, uh, the artificial intelligence question of robots lacking emotions, but they're at least sharing our own, right? Yeah. Um, and that, so that brings us perfectly to you, Ben, um, someone who has uh, been deeply involved in researching and un uncovering trolls and bots and other uh, nefarious uh, ways uh, that social media has been using. Maybe you could provide some perspective on what Christoph has already said and also discuss about the dangers of social media, how it's being used to shape our ideas, especially uh, in the West where we have uh, open debate and this kind of tradition of being open and transparent, when at the same time it's very easily, as Christoph has, met, has mentioned on social media, to manipulate. Absolutely, and, and, and what Christoph was saying reminded me of an interview I did two weeks ago um, in which the first question from the journalist was, are social media a threat to democracy? And if you just go back five years in time, 2011, 2012, the Arab Spring, how many headlines were there about Twitter and Facebook yeah. and Instagram as the new drivers of democracy? And there was this idea that the Arab Spring was born from the power of social media. So in six years, we flipped from they're the best thing ever to are they a threat to democracy? And that, that's an astonishingly rapid turnaround. What I mainly do is work on bots and trolls. And it's really important to understand the distinction. And something that I'm seeing a lot at the moment is people do not get the distinction. A couple of years back, the word troll was going around. And anybody who made any comment online which disagreed with somebody would be called a troll. Nowadays, what I'm seeing a lot is that anybody makes any unpleasant comment, particularly in the, in the US setting, will be called a bot. So <laughs> purely for the sense of, of clarity, a troll is a human being for a given value of human being, probably a fairly bored and nasty one, who sits at the keyboard and types unpleasant stuff. But it, a, a troll has fingers, and it has a heart, and it has a pulse, and it probably has various attitude issues, and maybe get, gets paid to do it. But a troll writes its own posts and then posts them. A bot is a social media account which is run by autopilot, effectively. So it will retweet other people, it will like other people, it will follow other people. There are very sophisticated bots out there which can actually create, look like they create their own posts. But the great majority of bots are simply accounts which are run on autopilot. And it's really important to understand not all bots are bad. A bot is simply 
a program, a, a, an account run by autopilot. So for example, all the big news organizations use bots because rather than employing somebody to say, oh, we've just done a headline, I'm going to type it in and post it, you get a bot to do it. There are bots which post poetry. There's a bot which used to take every day from the New Yorker archive of poetry one poem and just tweet it because poems are cool. There are, there are bots which will share photography because photos are cool. So the fact of being a bot is not in itself a bad thing. What we work on is social bots and political bots. And these are accounts which pretend to be human beings, but either tweet individually in massive volumes or tweet lots and lots of accounts or tweet or post lots of uh, the same thing all at the same time. And what they're doing is distorting democratic debate. And this is where the question of the threat to democracy comes in. If you think one of the key tenets of democracy is one man, one vote, or these days one person, one vote. If you have one person who has control of 10,000 fake accounts or 100,000 fake accounts online, and I have seen botnets which go over 100,000 in a single network, and that person gets all of those accounts to tweet or post or share or like the same thing at the same time, what happens to one man, one vote? What happens to one man, one voice? You've got one person with 100,000 voices. And one of the main ways in which we see bots used is you'll get a small group of users who will try and create a trend on a platform simply by using loads and loads of bots interacting with each other to do it. And so, for example, during the French election, there was a group of activists on the far right in France who were supporting Marine Le Pen. And regularly, at 4.50 p.m., every day of the week, they would launch a hashtag, and they would manage to get it trending. 4.50.00 every day. And the way they were doing this was using large networks of bots, together with a few trolls who were posting stuff. Looking at it, the, the main drivers of this traffic were six accounts. They were then amplified by a couple of hundred trolls. And between them, they were generating up to 45,000 tweets in the space of 90 minutes. And because of that volume, they were able to get their hashtags to trend. So you're thinking maybe 200 people in a country of 60 million people were managing to distort the debate mm -hmm. to that extent. So that's, that's the power of amplification. And it's really, it's like having a megaphone or a speaker system. One person mics themselves up with thousands of, of fake accounts and they can blast their message out much more loudly. And again, thinking of the French case, there were articles, in example, for the, uh, in the financial, financial Times talking about how powerful Le Pen supporters were on social media. Now, it was an accurate story, it was a good story, but it also highlighted the importance of a very, very small and radical group of people. And it ignored the other 59,999,740 people who just weren't involved in that. So it, in, it created the perception that Le Pen supporters were extremely powerful on social media, where in fact, again, it's a couple of hundred people. So it depends how you're measuring power. In terms of the work we do with the Digital Forensic Research Lab, what, one of the things we're doing is identifying bots and trolls and learning to tell them apart. And the way we normally do this is, is to look at three key indicators, activity, anonymity, and amplification. So the three A's, activity, anonymity, amplification. So you look at an account, and the first thing you do is you go to the profile page. And for example, on Twitter, it will always tell you when the account was created and how many times it's posted. So it's very easy to do the maths and say, well, if it was created two weeks ago, it's 14 days old, and it is posted 12,000 times. And I just, this morning, I found an account who had that pattern. Mm -hmm. So there's an account which is posting a thousand times a day. This is not a human level of behavior. So uh, either it's somebody who's an insomniac or <laughs> it's a bot. Th there are accounts out there which I know which were created 15 months ago and have been posting 800 times a day ever since. Wow. There's no way that that's a human pattern of behavior. So that, that's when you look at the activity. And there are various different judgments of how active an account has to be. Then you look at the anonymity. Does it have a name, or does it just have a, a scramble of letters and numbers for its name? Does it have a photo? Does it have a background image? You'll quite often find loads and loads of faceless accounts. They don't even have an avatar picture. They don't have a username. They're anonymous. There's no way of telling if there's a human being behind them. So if it's active and anonymous, you start suspecting it's a bot. Mm. And then you look at what it's actually posting. If it's posting its own content, then maybe it's just somebody who really does live on caffeine and no sleep, possibly. Uh, but if, if it's all it's posting is shares of other people's accounts and it's 100 or 200 or 300 or 400 retweets in a row, then you know that that is not a human being doing it. Because as we were saying, human beings want to share. 
if I'm online, I want to share my emotions and my thoughts, <coughs> why on earth would I be doing nothing but retweeting somebody else? Right. It doesn't make sense. So if, if you look at activity, anonymity, and amplification, you've got all three, you've got an account which is behaving like a bot. So uh, real briefly, if I may follow up, I mean, I think the danger, you've, you've outlined quite well the danger of how it works. But what happens when these messages by bots are then taken by people, and then it spreads even further? I mean, it, how is that, uh, how do these bots influence human behavior? There are a couple of ways they can do it. Um, the most common one is if, if they get, if they're trying to push, for example, a hashtag or a phrase, and that begins to trend, so if they get enough traffic on it that, that the Twitter algorithm thinks, hey, this is a cool, trendy topic, mm. then people who are not in that political bubble will see the hashtag crop up in their trending. And so the, the, the whole goal of these efforts is to make people who aren't in your little circle see what you're doing. So you manage to make it trend. Another way is sometimes that a particular genuine internet user will see it and pick up on it, and then they'll pass it on to all their followers. So you'll, it'll start with a botnet, but maybe that will trend in somebody's little local trending list. If that person's got 200,000 real followers and they retweet it, then it's out into the real world. So, so for the for the bot herders, most of the time it's about finding a way to make it trend or to get real people to notice it and start sharing it. Mm -hmm. The other main use of bots is to is to harass and intimidate people. So you'll find big clusters of botnets in the tens or hundreds of thousands, all of whom follow each other, and they will all start retweeting the same post at the same time. Mm -hmm. Now, because they all follow each other and none of them is followed by any real human beings, nobody's going to see that. But if what they're posting is an abusive message which is addressed to a human user, then that human user's timeline is suddenly going to be flooded right. with 100,000 offensive messages. And more and more we're seeing bots being targeted in that way to intimidate individual users, and nobody else is going to see it because nobody else is involved in that mm. information flow. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> um, thanks, Ben. Uh, just maybe uh, to remind everybody, a cool, trendy topic which is not being promoted by bots is the hashtag RigaConf17. <laughs> Uh, and I invite others uh, who are online to, uh, to also join in um, as real people into this, <laughs> this discussion. Now I want to turn now to, to Russia and Konstantin, uh, uh, because we've talked about already kind of the role of how there's a lot of manipulation on social media and the suspicions, uh, I mean, and evidence points that Russia is very uh, good at using social media outside Russia <laughs> to divide and uh, to, to create uh, divisions uh, in different countries on, on different topics which sometimes aren't even related remotely to Russian foreign policy. But inside Russia, on the other hand, it seems to be a different story. And I, th I think what's, what's very interesting when we looked at the protests earlier this year in March and June and how much the opposition has become quite savvy in using young people and using social media that the Kremlin is kind of behind the game in that regard. So I'd like to hear some of your comments, what you think how it looks in Russia uh, when we, when in the context of the discussion that we've already talked about, um, when you do have real people who are using social media uh, to oppose uh, some of the Kremlin activities. Well, I, I think the main thing uh, is that, uh, Adam, is uh, to understand that Russia in many ways is uh, still a, let's say, modern but not postmodern society. So there are lots of divisions inside the Russian society. And if you... <coughs> look at uh, what the Kremlin is doing in terms of propaganda and, and media policy. Uh, it's actually geared up to the same thing or to the same goal that we repeatedly discussed uh, during these two days. And that's right. essentially holding on to power, holding on to, to, to where the current people are with, with the kind of assets they have. So th that is the main goal. This is the main goal of, of this kind of, if I may say so, media policy of, of the Kremlin. And here they and they find themselves increasingly in a situation in which there are two audiences for them. Um, just a few days ago, I attended an opening of an exhibition in Moscow, dedicated actually to, the, to 1917, to the 100 years of the revolution, Bolshevik takeover, and, and, and there were lots of, uh, it was dedicated to essentially Lenin, doc documents of Lenin. Mm. And there was um, one of the people that is involved in organizing this exhibition, and he's been interviewed by uh, Rasiya, uh, Russia's main state channel. And so this very young correspondent, who's like 26 or 27, comes up with the mic to this esteemed 
archive researcher and, and, and says, well, you know, you have to speak very, very simply and very, very slowly. Our audience is above 50. <laughs> and to me, it was quite a symbol of uh, what's going on in the media picture and in media policy making mm. in, in Russia. Essentially, you have everyone was talking about the power of Russian television, say, three, four, five years ago. Right. And what it turns out is that you have one section of the society which still actually watches television and which still gets its not only news but opinions from state-controlled TV networks and the other section of the society which actually doesn't watch television. It's only online. For them, all these people that we discuss the many times mentioned Mr. Kisilov, who is the only Russian journalist who, unquote, <laughs> on the sanctions list. I mean, it's irrelevant to them. Well, here he may be relevant as a GIF on, a, on, a, on, a, on, on, on their favorite online platform, but nothing more. For them, their video bloggers are more more important. So in a sense, you or, or, or their favorite Twitter accounts or Instagram accounts right. or whatever. Yeah. So what you have, you have uh, these people following Alexei Navalny, for example, that do take their cue, they, they do take their emotions mm. and their facts. And you would even say they take their political science and political education, not from the state media. Uh, and this created a situation in which, for example, the famous uh, documentary about uh, uh, Mr. Medvedev's assets uh, has now been watched by 25 million people. Okay, some of them may be automatically generated sort of uh, likes or, or hits rather on the page, but still it's a vast, right. um, vast uh, 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 thing which is comparable actually to ratings of top TV programs, e top evening news on mm. Russian state TV channels. And if it's been watched by, let's say, not even 20 million, 10 million people in Russia, then it's not only been watched by one person, it's been watched by the Babushka and the Dedushka and the rest mm. of them. So I think that the outreach is pretty strong, and yes, uh, I think Russian opposition, for lack of other tools, has become pretty savvy yeah. at, 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 at using that. But on the other hand, of course, what you have, and as, as Russian politician Vladimir Milov once said, yeah, I mean, preparation for politics happens online, but real politics happens offline in the real world. So in a sense, I think that you can say that the government is paying attention to what goes on. And uh, the Kremlin's been very active in the last few years, especially after the protests of 2011, uh, in buying up uh, major internet portals and actually creating a new picture of the world for the Russians via, for example, forcing even notionally private companies like Yandex to censor their uh, news aggregators. Mm. So things won't come up that the government doesn't like. Uh, or, uh, alternatively, um, funding, well, botnets, as we all know, that push the message outside. And actually, I think that the messages that are being pushed, although they may be specific messages in for Catalonia and then another set of specific messages for the American elections and then yesterday for the German elections, whatever, but if you look at the main tenor of what's being sold, to the public, and especially in Russia. It's not policy specifics. It's not Putin is great. Well, he is great, of course. <laughs> but if you look at the overall tone, what is being sold is actually cynicism and irresponsibility. Mm. Mm. And these two things go hand in hand. Because... Emotions. Emotion, these are emotions, and these are also what is important, easy emotions. Mm. Because once you're cynical and say, oh, well, you know, don't talk to me about Western democracy and, uh, you know, this fight against corruption. Well, you had, you had the, I don't know, the minister, uh, uh, health secretary resigning in America because he used the private jet. So you see, in America, which is a great beacon of democracy, they tell us, and in Russia, I mean, it's the same thing. It's all corrupt. Of course, the difference is that in America you reside with your <laughs> private jet for public money. In Russia, you probably buy another jet. Uh, but 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 that escapes the public. Yeah. And I think that Russia is extremely. What people really do not understand many, I mean, in the West, which 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 I think is very important, um, 
80% of Russian society doesn't travel. So for when you tell people that corruption is actually the same in Russia and in the UK or in America or somewhere else, they believe it because they, absolu they have absolutely no reference point mm. to say, hold on a minute, this is not true because, you know, <laughs> I studied in Ghent and I know it's not true. No, um, you, you have this amazing figures of, you know, 50 million Russians traveling across the world per year. No, it's not true. Hmm. It's 50 million border crossings. I mean, I probably count for 10,000 Russians. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's a bit like a passport botnet. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> what I want to say is that uh, this message is simplified to a very significant part of the yeah. Russian population uh, by the fact that they have absolutely no reference point and, and, th th and because of that, not because they're stupid, but they don't have enough information to have an informed critique of what's being pushed on them. So it's cynicism and irresponsibility follows it. Because if all your troubles, the fact that you don't get paid a pension, or you get paid a very small one, no, they still pay the pensions, or your local village uh, medical point is being closed down, or you have a bad road, or have a corrupt mayor, if it is all, A, completely normal, and B, usually a fault of America, the Freemasons, Obama, you name it, I mean, green man from the UFO, then what can you do? And if you can't do anything, then what's the use of any kind of activism? What is the use of actually going voting? And especially, what is the use of actually going voting for someone who is not promoted by the government, because if you do and vote for someone who's, who's being pushed by, by the government, then uh, you probably are going to get your road fixed, because these guys have the power. That is the logic. And I suppose that what you have, you now have in the bigger cities, which are much more sort of, you know, media savvy, where people travel more. And we're talking years. We're talking about societal trends. What you see, you see a gradual... Um, emergence of people who think independently. I don't want to use this word opposition, pro Navalny, people who are able of independently critiquing reality and taking it in without any prompt from someone. I think this is the trend that we see. This is the trend that's been amplified by uh, Mr. Navalny mm. and uh, the fact that he managed to address the young generation. And this is a trend that will continue. It doesn't mean that it's revolution tomorrow. Right. But it's definitely a societal change in the big cities which will have an impact on how the society uh, eventually looks at this. If you wish, you, you can talk about opinion leaders. One last thing I want to mention in, in, in this respect, um, and that kind of circles back to the use of social media and video blogging and stuff like that. Uh, when I've spoken to... Uh, after the emergence of the famous Medvedev movie. I've spoken to um, someone who's uh, been my uh, journalism student and she's uh, 22 or 23 years old. And uh, she's quite professional. And it's also the world she lives in. And she said to me, you know what? Why this was such a... He made a lot of anti-corruption um, sort of investigations and uh, it's not the first time he went on the web exposing stuff. Why this was so successful? Because what's been used at the beginning of the film, as a journalist, you know that you have to start with something that hooks people and they were going to watch for a minute or read for a paragraph. If they left after that, you're not getting them back. If, they are, if, you don't kind of, if, if your claws are in them, then they, move, they, they continue reading or watching until the very end. So the claws that Navalny used, was that from the very beginning he used a very small thing, Medvedev ordering trainers on Amazon. Mm. Mm. It wasn't about, mm. you know, a chateau in Toscana, because it's completely irrelevant to an average Russian. He will never be in a Toscana chateau. And the young person probably will be, but he or she is still young enough, uh, not too young, too young to, to, to be there, to travel enough. But the fact that this man is number two man in Russia, orders things from Amazon <laughs> was something they could relate to. And that actually made 
this video so successful. Mm. It was explanatory and it was referenced in a way that was relevant to the target mm. audience. So in a sense you can see this is pure media theory which doesn't have anything to do with whether it's Facebook or whether it's a regular television. Yeah. But mm. the way you merge it, you merge old media wisdom with new technologies and new insights into psychology is very important. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. And it's worth pointing out that at the demonstrations themselves, an awful lot of the demonstrators were holding up pairs of trainers. I don't know. Trainers, yeah, trainers yeah, actually became a physical symbol of yeah, yeah. what the demos were about. Right. Yeah. Christoph, you wanted to add something? Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to add something very, uh, because um, in fact, Constantine said uh, something very interesting about Russia. Uh, Russia being a closed market, right? Um, this is very important. And this is a very major uh, trend on social media. Everybody believes that internet is a universal tool that people you can meet any kind of people all over all over the planet. One of those two billion people on Facebook that it's promoting diversity and so on and so on. A lot of studies are telling you the opposite, exactly the opposite. After ten years of using those social media, you get rid of people that do not believe and think and mm. live uh, right. the, the other way uh, compared to you. If you've got someone in my network who's voting Marine Le Pen, whatever, I'm going to get rid of it because I don't, I don't, want, I don't want to see this post, so hate or uh, whatever, you know, etc. So at the end of the day, after some years, you end by only connect, connecting with people who, who live like Echo you, Exactly. speak like you, share the same kind of value, whatever values, you know. And in fact, uh, social media are not uh, establishing diversity. They are doing, human beings are doing just the opposite of diversity. They are forming together, they are joining together in clubs, in bubbles, right? And those, and you very clearly see when you study social media that those bubbles are not connected to the other bubbles, mm -hmm, yeah. right? And when we are talking about influence, when, when, uh, when we talk about uh, bots uh, and, uh, and the, the, the example of uh, the, the bots, uh, the network from Marine Le Pen, etc., is th that kind of example. You have to activate your bubble and you have to activate your bubble to make it loud, right? So people will understand, wow, well, eventually something is going on there. So it's all about, you know, creating this. But in fact, uh, and one of the reasons why it's uh, spectacular in, in Russia, uh, I mean, we're, we're all talking about Facebook, but just think about two countries, uh, Russia and China. In those two countries, Facebook is nothing, nearly nothing. If you go to, to, to Russia, you will see that the number one uh, network is contact. Right, it's nothing to do with Facebook, so it's not connected to the rest of the world. It's not connected to Western world. And if you go to China, you will see that it's Facebook is nowhere, Google is nowhere, right? Twitter is nowhere. People will talk about Baidu. People will talk about these these uh, these networks that are pure Chinese, right? So the, the 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 dream of a universal web or universal social media is is controlled by by those those phenomena who, who are just putting people again in the same bubbles that are very close. Mm. Very good point. I, we have about 15 minutes or so and I want to give some time to our audience who is pr here uh, participating. A couple questions. I'll take two or three. Yes, please. My name is Natalia Fralova. I'm New Times Magazine from Russia. You just told that some people are closed in this uh, bubbles and my question about the censorship in the social media how it can be organized who should be responsible for it we understand if we are mm, call somebody for uh, violation for if we insult somebody but if we are talking about political interference in uh, uh, election in some process how should it be that's that's a question that, I try, that, that that has tried. This is a very important question that you're making. This point has tried to be addressed for since internet is is uh, is there, and nobody has e ever managed to to get this uh, solved. If you're just talking about Facebook, Twitter, contact the big ones, okay, they will tell you I'm not responsible. I'm just providing the tools, the means, right? 
and people are doing whatever they want to do on Facebook. Plus, we are an American company, so an American company has a first amendment that was uh, quoted before in the previous session, where freedom of speech is something like stone, right? If you go to France, if you go to Germany, if you go to other countries in Europe, etc., the freedom of speech regulation is not the same. You know, in France, if you say something against gay people or etc., you will be fined. You, you know, because it's prohibited. If you promote some racist post uh, on, on, on in France, as an example, you will be you, 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 it will be it will be fined as well. But it will not. It will stay on Twitter. It will stay on Facebook because those companies are saying, "Okay, we are American companies, and we respect the American rights." So it's nearly impossible. So who's responsible? We are responsible. And the, the, there's a big part of the of the, the you know, a previous speaker was telling, "It's a pity that people do not teach history at schools anymore." I'm I'm a strong believer that something that should be taught taught in the schools is how to use internet, how to use social networks, how to use that kind of stuff. This is a masterpiece and like for, like for the people that are 12 years old or whatever that are just happening to, to enter in those stuff, because if not, we will all be uh, uh, um, a planet of stupid people. Thank you, Christophe. Uh, Tomo tomorrow on Russian television, famous French expert says there is no free speech in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, <laughs> we're waiting for the headline. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. That's, well, that's how it's done. Right. That's how it's done exactly for the Russian right. audience, and they can absolutely discern. They wouldn't be able to figure out which context was used, when it was said, how it was said, what was the um, entourage, and what, yep. was, what was the context. And then you have 100,000 bots. Uh, yeah, saying, oh, yeah, saying, yeah. Well, yeah. this is famous guy. But I, yeah. Christoph, you make a good point about education. However, I fear, um, having two little kids myself, is that our children are better users of social media than their teachers. And so this is a huge challenge. Y yes and no, because in fact, uh, they, are, they, are, they are confronted with instant flow of information, right? Like we are. If you don't stop, if you don't take some, some pushback from this flow, you, you, you cannot, your brain cannot understand, cannot get knowledge, right? It's a matter of getting knowledge. You have to stop. You have to stop the time and you have to say, okay, I want to understand. You see things, but you don't understand things, right? So people are, at the end of the day, can talk about any kind of topic that is happening uh, around the world, but they don't know anything about the topics themselves, uh, like deeply, right? Mm. It's yeah. not knowledge. Mm. It's just kind of a memory. Right. And there are, there are skills that you can teach kids which are really, really simple like how to reverse search an image. So if you, if you find an image in Google Chrome and you right click on it, one of the options is search for this image in Google and it'll show you all the other times that image has been used. If you find a fake internet account, show it to the kids and show them, look, here's a nice looking account, quite often a young lady. Look, isn't it odd that she's got 17 different names and 17 different Twitter accounts and it's all the same photo? What do we think is going on there, children? It's skills like that which they're not gonna pick up from their peers at schools. True. But it's as simple as a right click. Yeah. Good point. I now know what I should do <laughs> going back home. We have a question here and then one more over here. So, hello, Carlos Mixon from Latvian Public Television. Uh, earlier you were talking about these bots who is sharing this content to make it popular. How do you fight this? Let's call this propaganda with counter propaganda or what? No, I mean, if, if you put out more bots who are tweeting on the same subject, then you're just making the same subject louder. And there was a classic example in the US about a month ago where. The New York Times published a very negative piece about Donald Trump. Um, it was amplified by a number of bots which just amplify news posts, so they were unpolitical. Then they were amplified by anti-Trump bots. Then the pro-Trump brigade noticed this and started messaging each other saying, hey, this, the, 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 and the phrase was Trump is his own worst enemy. So they started messaging each other on Trump is his own worst enemy. Then their bots kicked in and started amplifying them. <laughs> and then further far-right bots kicked in and started amplifying that. So you had an enormous argument going on, but the result was that instead of trending for one hour, this thing trended for eight hours because the two sides were going. So, so you don't want to use the same tactics. It'll make it worse. The best thing to do is actually teach people how do you recognize a bot. Uh, by the time we've recognized them and posted about them, it's an hour and it's too late. But if you teach people, you look for the activity, 
you look for the anonymity and you look for the amplification. Look at the account. Is there any way that you can tell it's a human being? If it is a human being, why is it posting 1,000 times a day? When does it sleep? Why is it only posting retweets? Well, there you've got a bot, and, it, and then it's up to you. Do you mute it? Do you report it as spam? Do you block it? The choice is yours. But if you can teach every user how to do that, then the bots will still be there, but there's much less impact that they can actually have. Yeah, very good point. OK, we'll take one question here yet. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, name is Hamid Lajavardi. I have a question to you. Um, could you explain the phenomenon of Navalny? Typically, over the last uh, decade or so, if there was a serious opposition to Putin or Putinism, they were typically gotten rid of. And we have a few examples of that, whether they were journalists or politicians mm -hmm. or whatever. But it seems like Navalny is walking the kind of walk where he's thrown into prison for a few days, and then he's out, and then they throw him into prison again. Uh, how do you analyze that? Is the Kremlin kind of saying, okay, you can be a little opposition, but don't get too cocky. If you do, we'll send you there. And if I may, to you, uh, you talked about the fact that diversity in Facebook and the community that has created, but isn't it also the same in Russia with Contact or Baidu that within Russia, it is also a community, it is also diversity. So it does serve some purpose within Russia for people to see different points of view that may not be necessarily the one from the Kremlin. Thank you. Okay, so why don't we start? Um, Hamid, thank you for the question. I, I think you forgot that um, Alexei Navalny has a brother, Oleg, and Oleg is in jail, and he's a hostage of the Kremlin. And so while Alexei couldn't be put in jail for reasons I will also explain, um, his brother is there, and any kind of quote-unquote accident could happen to him any time. So when we talk about Alexei Anatolievich, we have to remember that he's not alone in this big trouble. Secondly, I think that there is, of course, and you are quite right to say, that of course, well, Russia is not North Korea, and uh, the regime there is uh, quite savvy at manipulating public opinion. Actually, that's what they spend most of their time on. Um, and I suppose that the idea and the perception, the conclusion they drew from the 10-year Hodorkovsky saga is that you really don't want to create martyrs. And um, if, because if you put Navalny in jail, then the sequence is pretty clear. It's the Sakharov Prize, the European Parliament Prize, nomination for the Nobel Prize, and then have a problem. <laughs> and it's a bigger one than uh, with Mr. Khodorkovsky, because with Mr. Khodorkovsky, you had different public opinion in Russia from the one we have today. And you could go and say to, you know, all the gullible sort of um, uh, Western useful stooges, well, you see, he was an oligarch who robbed the Russian people, so, well, he's got his due, well, a bit dirty, but still. No, you can't do that to Navalny. He's not an oligarch. He didn't rob the Russian people. So you can't ha have this narrative. So they've been there before. They don't want it now. What they think, that is my understanding. I'm not sort of, I'm, I don't work for the Kremlin, luckily. Uh, <laughs> they think that they can have it under control. And they think that even with all these young people hitting the streets, well, you know, eventually it's only, they are 17, 18, 20, well, then they have to go and raise a family and go into professions and then they will become much more sober and in the end they will va value stability. And uh, I think that this is, and some of them will partake in the corruption pie eventually. So I think that the idea is that we have it under control, we have this no one can say that we don't have an opposition. Well, Secretary Tillerson comes to Moscow tomorrow and says, well, you don't have democracy. In oh, come on. Navalny was an echo Moscow saying that Putin is a dictator yesterday. What more do you want? So this idea of controlled opposition that's boxed in, opposition in the ghetto, not new, really. But we have to remon remember there is a hostage, and we have to remember that this very frequently backfires, but who said that Russia is run by geniuses? <laughs> <laughs> Christoph, briefly. No, uh, 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 br briefly, uh, what, what, you're, what you're saying is right, uh, but in fact, when I, was, when I was talking about bubbles, it's even smaller bubbles. 
even in a country like this, you know, it's not a bubble of uh, thousands or millions of people. You end up on Facebook, on, on contact or wherever, with a bubble of 50 or 100 people that you share the same story every day. So you only see those 50 people, right? Facebook can have w 2 billion people online. You will only see at least maximum 50 people. Because on the top of it, Facebook has invented an algorithm that will allow you to see only those people. Because Facebook believes, the machine, not Facebook, but the machine believes that those people are the ones you would prefer to see when you open your Facebook. So it, it limits, it narrows your horizon, and at the end of the day, you don't get diversity at all. Yeah, that's the same. Yeah, and, and if you think on, for example, on Twitter, when you know when you're looking at an account, one of the one of the, um, the measures you're looking at is how many accounts they're following, and you think, I, you know, I've seen accounts which are following a hundred thousand other accounts, and you think, no, that's just not possible. There, there, there is literally and physically no way you can do that. Anything more than a few hundred accounts, you can't actually keep up with them all. So, so d yeah, th this is where the machine meets the man. <coughs> you know, my my laptop is a genius. I am not. So I can't actually track a thousand accounts. And, and, and so there's this inherent human limitation on how much data you can process. And Christoph, you brought up a really good point about the algorithms. Yeah. And I would add into that also is uh, the fact that these social media sites now are private, profit-driven uh, sites, which also use all that data that they gather to promote products. Um, Absolutely. And, I, and I've got, uh, and I've, there, there's, but you have to know that there, there's a group of people that are, you know, Twitter is doing very badly at the, at the stock market. It's not, not ma making any profit. And there are some voices all around Europe and uh, including in America that are calling Twitter to become a foundation, mm. right? Like Wikipedia or whatever, because in fact they believe that Twitter is so useful not only to Mr. Trump but to to the community, to the journalists, to be informed and to be kept informed about what something's going on. That it shouldn't be like driven by profit or what, like that kind of stuff, but it should be driven by just like like Wikipedia by, by users. And I think this is a fair idea, and uh, it's it's a very good idea. And I'm I'm sure it this idea will grow, and I'm sure this idea will. Probably in the next before next year, uh, we'll s well create something bigger. Very interesting, Ben. I'm going to give you. We have one minute left. I'm going to give you the last word. End on something positive because we've talked about a lot of the negative side of social media. <laughs> but <laughs> people are cleverer than bots. You can teach people how to spot bots. You can teach an eight-year-old how to spot bots. Everyone can learn it. The challenge is just making sure that people do. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all. Thank you for the panelists for your very interesting insight. And thank you to the audience uh, online who has been following us and watching the uh, debate. And the conference will continue in a, a minute or two with the next panel in the big hall. Thank you.